All right. Check one, two, check, check. Check one. Check one, two, check, check. That's the clerk's mic. Check one, two, check, check, check. Cool. Check one, two, check, check.
Without objection, Senator from the 10th will be excused. Are there any other motions to excuse? Any other motions? Senator from the 40th is recognized. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to excuse the gentleman from the 56 who's out of the Capitol on business. 56, without objection, Senator from the 56 will be excused. Any other motions to excuse? Senators, please signify your presence by voting the yay switch. The Secretary will unlock the machine.
Good morning. The hour of convening has arrived, and the Georgia House is open and ready for business. Uh, Representative Stovall and I are here, and we're ready to move forward with the business of the people and, and for this House. At this point in time, if y'all would join with me in a just a moment of remembrance for our dear friend John Meadows and, and his family, and a moment of silence, and I'm going to say a brief prayer. If you will, bow with me and remember with me. Thank you. Heavenly Father, for the memories, the work, the accomplishments, the family man, the Christian man, the grandfather and father that John Meadows represented in so many different lives, in so many different ways, Lord, we just thank you for his service to you, Lord, and to all those he loved and the things he loved, especially this state and this house. God, we ask you to strengthen and be with and comfort his family this day, Father, and the days that in the future, Lord, that we know that they will need your comfort and the strength that only you can provide to them. Father, we again just thank you for the blessings for our state. We ask you to guide us today as we, we, as we go about our business, Father. Keep us safe, Father. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. No other business to come right now. I'll tell you that this house uh, is ready for business again, and now this time we'll, we'll stand at ease and await the uh, further development of business for the day that the Senate may uh, bring to us. We'll stand at ease. Thank you, Representative. We will do that. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's back up one, do one more piece of business for the House. Let's stand and pledge the flag, flag if you will. Proof it does take a team to make things work correctly. Thank you. At this point in time, we'll stand at ease for uh, an hour or so here, and, and let's see um, if the Senate can get to their work, and we'll see, and we'll work with um, what they bring back to us. Thank you. We're at ease. house into a home, a stranger to a friend. That was Melody Beatty. When we are grateful, when we express our gratitude, when we give thanks, that which is not enough can be more than enough. It can be sufficient for all our need. So as we all together enter into this week of Thanksgiving, I invite you to in your own hearts and, and minds to think about the things for which you are grateful and to give thanks. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, what a privilege it is to stand in this place, in this beautiful room, under the dome of our great state, the capital of our great state, as these senators will hopefully finish their deliberations today and return to their homes. Give them safe travels. Uh, be with them. Uh, may they know of your grace, your mercy, and your wisdom. We continue to pray for those who recover from the storms that ravaged our state and others. We pray for those who have been devastated by the fires in California and all those in between the, the great coasts of this great country who this morning suffer, who are in need. May the helpers, may those of us who are able find ways to make a difference in their lives. May we, out of our gratitude, share out of our abundance that they too may know a peace and of God, that is what we pray for most. We pray for peace in our homes, in our communities, in our state, in our country, in our world. May your peace pervade all those places so that we might give thanks and acknowledge you in all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Are there any unanimous consent? Senators wishing to rise on a point of personal privilege. Senator from the 14th will be recognized on a point of personal privilege. Good morning, Mr. President. Let me begin by congratulating former Secretary of State on becoming our next governor. You see, I'm reading a book here called View from the Top that provides some incredible wisdom as we look at great leaders and how they shape the world. You see, great leaders focus on others rather than themselves. They put the people they were elected or hired to lead first regardless of whether they came from or what life experiences they may have encountered, they never see themselves as a victim or a martyr. As we move past this special session and quickly into Thanksgiving and Christmas, Mr. President, the senator's having difficulty um, hearing. If y'all will quieten down, I know some of you may not want to listen to what he has to say, but please keep your, your voice uh, down. As we move past this special session and quickly into Thanksgiving and Christmas, let us focus our attention away from lawsuits, personal attacks, and what we are elected to do. That is to serve those that need our help. You see, we're in a warm building right now, but yet we have thousands of Georgians in South Georgia struggling to cope with the aftermath of Hurricane Michael, and they're looking to us to lead. We don't need more rhetoric or activism, but we need to get busy together as one Georgia, helping these people restore their lives and once again give them hope. Ladies and gentlemen, my hope and my prayer is that when we leave today, we can go enjoy Thanksgiving and we can continue to think about those that are not in this building but are relying on us. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Chair recognize Senator 29th, 29th on a point of personal privilege. I know the chamber is filled with great sadness as uh, I deliver my final point of personal privilege. I just want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. I am thankful to you, Mr. President. I am thankful for every member of this body. I know sometimes we disagree and have debates. We may have some today. Uh, but I have just been blessed by the friendships and uh, the, just the, the example that everyone in this room sets. Thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. Record time, ladies and gentlemen, record time. Chair and I, Senator from the 11th, gentleman from America's 13th, I'm sorry. I think the 11th does want to. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to take a moment to recognize some special people who are here today. And that's our Capitol Police and the state troopers that are out there. If you recall earlier this year, we had a deranged individual come and set himself on fire here at the Capitol, and they had to handle that. And each and every day, they handle a lot of things to help keep us safe while we're here to do the people's business. So I would ask that you join me in a round of applause for our Capitol Police and State Troopers. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Chair recognizes is the Senator from Bainbridge, Senator from the 11th. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very brief, and I'll uh, reserve my opportunity to speak a little later about my district during the 
uh, debate on the, the bills on the floor. But I did want to uh, let everybody know that I've, I've put a letter on your desk. A lot of people have reached out to me and asked what they could do for, for Southwest Georgia. I've talked to a lot of uh, people who've been through similar disasters trying to figure out wh what's the best way to uh, uh, make the most difference going forward. And all of them have told me that, that uh, the thing that gets uh, damaged the most but uh, fixed the slowest is, is housing, especially for low income and moderate uh, income people. And so um, uh, my brothers and I have gotten together and established a foundation to try to uh, raise money uh, and we will we'll get uh, expertise to help us with a program to, to uh, keep people in their homes that they, they invested their life savings in. And, and one of the, the dangers in our rural communities is if people don't have a safe place to live, they're gonna move away. And that's just going to exacerbate the, the flight out of the rural communities that, that uh, we're forced because of economic reasons. So I would uh, certainly ask you, uh, the senator from the uh, 53rd, who's not at his desk, I don't know where he is, but uh, you know, every now and then he says something that's, that's wise. And he said, Dean, this place is all about relationships. Yeah, every now and then, uh, I did say that. But, but he has said uh, that, that uh, you know, this place is built on relationships and every one of you have relationships with people who are successful in this state, successful in this country from an economic standpoint. And I would ask you as a personal favor for the Senator from the 11th to reach out to those people, ask them in this season of giving and thanks to, to uh, uh, get, sit down, uh, go on the internet, find this website and uh, send some money so we can keep the, the roof over the heads and the, the folks in my district warm and dry through this uh, uh, difficult winter that they'll be facing. Uh, I appreciate everybody's consideration and thanks so much uh, for everything you've done for me this week. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Chair, recognize President Pro Tem of the body, the Senator from the 39th on a point of personal privilege, 49. Mr. President, I'll yield my time to the senior members of the chamber. If they could come forward. sure what this is all about, but Chair will recognize uh, the Senator from the 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, we, we know we're here to help the people in the Senator from the 11th and the, and the 12th and, and all those in Southwest Georgia. But we're, we're also here to recognize our true leader that's been with us for how many years? 12? as Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. On behalf of the entire Senate, we'd like to present this Rolex watch for your service and the love that we have for you. Thank you very much. And on the back of the watch, it says, State Senator from 1995 to 2006, Casey Cagle, Lieutenant Governor from 2006 to 2018. So thank you. Now I'm yielding my time to the Senator from Gwinnett. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, it's, it's very difficult for me to get up here and talk and to talk about our president of the Senate and not have tears come down my face. Um, as I, those of us that stand up here, we are the longest serving tenured senators. And um, even though this is a, a, a precious gift given to you, it really is just symbolic of our love and how much our appreciation and how fairly you have treated all of us during your tenure. And we understand that it's not just you that you have had and you've had a vision to have a wonderful staff behind you that has carried on in what is uh, transitioning into 
a new administration. So with that, I'm, I'm going to stop before I start crying and uh, just say thank you. Uh, you, especially with the Women's Caucus, you have always, always listened to our issues. You've always put us first, and uh, we're just very, very appreciative. been drafted again. <laughs> but that's all right. It's a good service. I just wanted to use my time as well to say uh, how much I really, really appreciate uh, serving with the Lieutenant Governor, both as a senator and his position as Lieutenant Governor. I thought he's treated me extremely fair. And in the final analysis, I think that's what uh, it's all about, how you relate to other people. And uh, other than the partisan stuff, just a minute part of that, the, for a great deal of the time, we are on the same page, most of us, and we do, and he has done a lot of great things for the great state of Georgia, and we certainly appreciate that. God bless you and Godspeed. Thank you so much. Over the years, I guess I've introduced Casey Cagle, I don't know, 25 or 30 times, maybe more than that. And uh, I've always said that... Uh, that I watched him come into the Senate as a, a very young senator and uh, full of vim and vigor and a couple other descriptions that people use. I won't, I won't use in mixed company. But, uh, but, but full of great ideas and full of energy. And over time, I've watched him evolve as a leader as well into a person who's very measured and very level-headed. And that's not something that comes naturally sometimes in politics. But I've watched the way he's treated people of both parties uh, through, the, through the years. And I've watched the way he has approached problems, both big and small. And I've always found him to be the same person uh, down there in his chamber behind closed doors as he was up here, pre pretty forthright and wanting to do the right thing. Uh, that's a pretty good compliment for people in our business. Uh, if we leave with that compliment behind us, I think we will have done our job. But Casey, uh, we appreciate your service and your friendship and the, the leadership that you've brought to our state. You leave it a, a better state than you found it, I can tell you that. Thank you so much. been honored to serve with our lieutenant governor for quite a while now. When I first came in with Senator Butler, uh, we both came in at the same time, he was a senator like I was. And then he became lieutenant governor. He has served us as, as it has already been said. He's done the right thing. He's looked out for us. Whenever I needed to go talk to him about some constituent's problem or concern, he was always open. And I certainly appreciated that open door. So I want to thank him for his years of service. I keep asking him, what, what's he going to do when he leaves? I'm going to miss him. Because most of my time, mm, I have spent with him here. So I want to um, wish him the best. No, he will continue to do good things for us, for the state, and enjoy his family and his life. So I want to thank him and wish him well. Okay, so everybody's been so serious. When I came in Senate, Casey and I used to sit right back there. I was behind him, though. And when he'd come to the well whining, 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 whining. And he come back to his seat. I say, shut up, Casey. <laughs> but you know, when it was my time to whine, and I went to his office, you know what he said to me? Come on in, Senator. So I appreciate you, Casey, for being so open whenever I had an issue and I could come to your office, or whenever I had guests and just popped in your office, you said, come on in. So thank you, and I wish you the best for your future. Thank you.
You know, it's been a, a long, long time that I've, I've known this great man and I'm going to miss him. Many of you don't know, but I had two tenures in the uh, legislature. I won the unexpired term of Arthur Lankford in 93. And I came and I saw this good looking man with the big blue eyes and he was a senator then. <laughs> and uh, he was just so gracious all the time, just like many of you, some of you rather, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and and uh, you know, I really got to know him and I was here until 2002 when I left uh, to run for Congress and retired and left and I thought I'd never come back. And in uh, 08, I ended up running again and coming back and he was the Lieutenant Governor when I came back. And he was even greater once I got back. So it's been a, a, a long time working with the Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle and seeing his beautiful family come from little babies to grown people and then grandbabies. And so we've been through a lot together, even though he probably didn't realize that I remember every little detail and how they have ev evolved into greatness. And I know, uh, you know, when one door closes, another one opens, and he's just gonna keep climbing and climbing. He's gonna be here for us in so many different ways. His legacy li will live forever. But you know what, I'm gonna miss him, and so I wanna cry too, but I'm trying not to. I just want you to know, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Casey Cagle, you're you rock. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, first of all, this is quite, is quite a surprise. Um, you know, I've, one, I've never owned a Rolex, could never afford one. Uh, now that I'm getting out of politics, maybe I can buy another one too. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, you know, as, as I reflect upon um, you know, this beautiful timepiece, uh, the thing that I'm reminded of is every time I look at this watch from this day forward, I'll be reminded of the time that I spent in this great body and getting to be with each of you and so many others that have come before us and the great legacies that have been left. And the time in which we have had together has been a time that's been worthwhile uh, for the citizens of our state. And we certainly have strived to leave it in a better place. And so I'm very humbled and honored uh, to have been a state senator and a lieutenant governor, and I will forever love the state senate and will look uh, forward to coming back and visiting with you guys. Uh, but I also am reminded that life is about faith and forgiveness. That's the path forward. And uh, in, in these, um, these time the, the moment that I've been able to spend with my family since the election has been uh, quite priceless as well. And I have been uh, so grateful and so thankful for that uh, time. And um, we will all um, reflect upon the short time that we've been here because it does go really, really quick uh, and be encouraged to make the very most of the time in which we do have. And so it's very fitting to have a beautiful timepiece like this that will remind me of this great body that I love so much in each of you. Thank you so much and God bless you. Chair and I, Senator from the 49th. Mr. President, isn't it true that Senator Mullis bought that timepiece in China? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check, you know, to see if it was uh, a replica or not. It might have been, but uh, anyways, very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have an R for Rolex. I'm not quite sure what that means. No. I think that says Polex. No. Polex. <laughs> Polex. <Polex. laughs> no. Thank you all very, very much. Senator from the 22nd, are you wishing to be recognized? You're recognized this time. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I also echo the sentiment in this chamber. Thank you for your service. It was an honor to serve under you. 
I also want to be very brief and I want to talk about HB 5 EX and I will be brief because I know everyone's ready to go root on the dogs and jackets and eagles and other great uh, football schools we have here in Georgia. But I do want to briefly say that normally when we talk about mergers and acquisitions, that's a good thing since we're talking about business here. But I also want to talk about potential merger of two interests that possibly is going to happen which would be very detrimental to all of us if we don't do better. And those two interests are the merger of interests of those who don't really believe that government has any role other than just protection of people as far as using government expenditures are concerned. There's also those interests who say we can do better and we should spend more money and we should not give away these corporate giveaways and we should spend more money on infrastructure projects and other things of that nature. And these two interests really have been opposed to each other. But both of these interests have something in common, whether they really believe that government doesn't have much of a role at all other than our security, or those who believe that government have, should have a bigger role in infrastructure, they both have something in common that they keep asking us, what are we doing with all of these tax exemptions and corporate giveaways that we keep doing? And our only answer has strictly been, it's good for business. But both of these interests have started to say lately, on the R side and on the D side, that's not good enough. And so what I would hope that we would do in the next coming session is that we start thoroughly vetting these things and we're going to have this debate on this particular issue more thoroughly later. But we have to do better as far as telling our people why we continue to do this. I would dare say that we vet our local arts council more thoroughly if they ask us for $2,500 than we vet some of these corporations who are asking for millions. We have to do better. So when these interests merge, these interests of one saying, we don't really think government ought to do anything, and these interests that say, we think government could do more, but both of them saying, how are you finding all this money to continue to give away to these corporate interests? When both of them are saying that, when those interests merge, if we don't have a better answer, and we haven't done a better due diligence in investigating why we're doing these things, none of us are going to like the results. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield away. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 30th. Senator from the 30th. Mr. President, I move that House Bill 4, Echo X ray, be engrossed. House Bill 4 EX, read the caption. House Bill 4 EX by Re Representative Rhodes of the 120th and others, a bill be titled an Act Amend Article 2 of Chapter 7 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to imposition rate, computation, and exemptions from income taxes so as to create a tax credit for certain taxpayers based on certain expenses incurred due to Hurricane Michael and for other purposes. Mr. President, that concludes the order. Moving for engrossment on 4EX, is there objection? There is objection. All those in favor, rise, stand, and be counted if you're in favor of engrossment.
on the motion for engrossment, the yeas are 28 and the nays are 12, and the motion for engrossment has failed. Chair recognize Senator from the 30th. Mr. President, I ask that we reconsider. Senators asking for reconsideration. All of those in favor to uh, reconsider its action on engrossment will rise, stand, and be counted. Rise, stand, and be counted. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the motion for engrossment, the yeas are, I'm sorry, reconsideration, reconsideration, 36, and the nays are 16. And the Senate has reconsidered its action on the matter of engrossment of House Bill 4EX, which is in front of us now. All those in favor of engrossment of House Bill 4EX will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary and like the machine. Recognize Senator in the 41st. State your inquiry. It, it, is it a sign of the future when your majority caucus can't even win the first vote of the session, Senator? <laughs> On the motion to engross House Bill 4EX, the yeas are 35, nays are 16, and House Bill 4EX has now been engrossed. Secretary will read House Bill 1EX. House Bill 1EX by Representatives Ralston the 7th and others, a bill be titled an act to men and act, making and providing appropriations for the state fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2018 and ending June 30th, 2019, known as the General Appropriation Act and for other purposes. Mr. President, that concludes the order. Chair recognizes the distinguished senator from the 4th, the Appropriations Chairman, to present the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I bring you House Bill 1EX, and uh, it's been a, a, a week that's been uh, focused on recognizing what, it, what all has happened in our state and trying to devise the best way to help those citizens that have been affected by it. And I just want to salute the, uh, those who worked on this all week. Uh, of course, the, the the governor and his staff, Teresa McCartney, uh, uh, Chris Riley, the chief of staff, who who listened and, and changed the proposal uh, after listening to 
to many of you and, and to members of the House to try to come up with the best package that we could to begin the process of rebuilding uh, a very important part of our state. Let me just take a second and, and, and remind everybody how important that southern and southwestern part of the state is. Over the years, the, the farming activities in California have been affected by the lack of water and uh, the competition between housing and industry and farming has resulted in, in the reduction of a great deal of farming. In the, Florida, in the extreme southern part of Florida, there used to be a lot of truck farming going on down there, and that has uh, not, not as big as it used to be, and maybe because of development. I, I'm not real sure. But the importance of southern and southwestern Georgia in the agriculture community is just so impressive if you look at that sheet that was handed out that shows you uh, the farm gate values of, of uh, crop lands and of crops and, and production of agricultural commodities that is coming out of southwest Georgia. It is just uh, so impressive that southwest Georgia, and, and if you think about it, it's partially because of the moderate, a little more moderate temperature in that part of the state. And then, of course, the, the, the abundant, abundant supply of water that's available uh, and, the, and the great land that they have down there. So it's, it's, a it's a strategic importance to our state and to our country that we continue to keep agriculture strong in that part of the state. It's important to our country as well as to our state. So that's a, a little bit of the background that I've had on my mind all week and just hadn't, hadn't really discussed it with anybody. But just uh, as you know, on October the 10th, uh, seems like a long time ago in one respect, but for those those people who've been affected, it's it's been eons ago. Hurricane Michael struck the Florida Panhandle with Category 4 winds, came right straight out of South America and just went right straight up into the Panhandle of Florida. Uh, by the time it continued straight up and, and slightly to the east, it it hit southwest Georgia with Category 3 hurricane winds. If you think about it, I mean, Category 3 hurricane winds anywhere from 125 to 150 miles per hour. That, that's, that rate of speed of winds will just about take down anything. There aren't, there aren't many things built or many uh, trees or croplands that will withstand a, a wind of that, of that speed. So this storm left catastrophic conditions in the rural areas and farmland and small communities of southwest Georgia as the storm moved through middle Georgia and exited in, in east Georgia. State facilities, uh, that facilities that belong to the state suffered $23.5 million in damages and the storm really spared no area of life, particularly in, in that southwest Georgia corner. There's widespread damage to infrastructure, to buildings of all types, and it had a devastating effect on timber, croplands, and other crops like pecans. Overall, agricultural losses in the state total some $2.5 billion in row crops, wood products, timber, and pecan crops and trees. I won't prolong it, but let me just give you a short list of some of the largest uh, losses in agricultural commodities and, and so forth. So here's a partial list of agricultural losses that occurred in Georgia, but they're heavily located in the southwest corner of the state. Timber losses total $763 million. That's three quarters of a billion dollars. Just think about that. Just think about that total and let that sink in a minute. It was $480 million in direct vegetable losses. I was mentioning about the fact that that's a, a, a top vegetable and commodity growing area of the, of the country now in that part. Almost a half a billion dollars. The cotton industry. And this was the worst possible time because cotton was had already started harvesting cotton. It was full blown, uh, ready to be picked. And the when the winds went through those, through those fields, it just basically picked the cotton. It actually picked it cleaner than the machines will. If you, if you look at a field of cotton after a machine's been through it, you can still see pieces of cotton. And it still looks a little bit white. You saw these pictures of these fields. It it completely removed all the cotton. 
That was $600 million. That's over, over a half a billion dollars. And when you combine the loss of pecans and the permanent loss of pecan trees, just those two things, these losses total $360 million, and that does not count the future loss of income on the trees that won't produce uh, anymore because they're on the ground. Now, these are not the total losses, just the largest numbers. Local governments were hit with damaged infrastructure and facilities, and critical facilities like local hospitals suffered damage, and I hope that we'll be looking at that issue uh, when the session convenes in January. Department of Transportation um, suffered widespread damage of signs. When you think about those signs that, it, it that, that are wide on, on, on roads nowadays and the wind catches them just right, uh, they're just like a parachute. They just take right off. They had, of course, tremendous uh, debris to be removed and, and damages to the roads, ways, and bridges as well. Governor Deal called this special session to address the needs of these citizens and these communities in the affected areas. And House Bill 1EX is the appropriations bill that delivers the monetary aid <coughs> to these areas. House Bill 1EX adds $270.8 million to the FY 2019 budget. That includes $205.8 million in general, state general funds and $64.9 million in motor fuel funds. This is fiscally sound because the budget that we're under, the FY19 budget, uh, actually only requires 2.2% growth in revenues. And as we, as we all know, the, the state so far this fiscal year is, is running 8.8% ahead of last year. So uh, I mentioned in committee yesterday, I'm writing a column this week on things I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the fact that we are deciding what we need to do not having to consider whether we have the money to do it or not. Some states would not would have to ba balance uh, the cost versus what we're doing. We're trying to do everything we can that we think we need to do, and it has been without regard to the cost, and that's a, that's a good thing. So here's a quick review of the bill. There's a total of $69.3 million going into the governor's emergency fund. Most of this, these funds will be spent providing the state match for federal assistance. It's $42 million of that total that's going to pay the state match for the federal funds from the, the Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency that has spent some $213.8 million in aid and direct expenses in the disaster area. Just as an aside, uh, we sometimes forget that the, the aid we get from the federal government has a, has a match to it. Some of us remember when Katrina hit Louisiana, the state match for the federal aid in, in uh, Louisiana was, two, was uh, over $2 billion. So there, there, is a, there is a match to be paid. There's another $9.3 million for the state share of the $37.3 million in, that other state agencies have spent as well. And also, we need to maybe stop and and, and take a moment to recognize the strong response that state agencies have paid to this storm. You know, over the years, I can remember several emergencies where state agencies really responded and did a great job. The, the one that sticks out in my mind is the, the floods of 1994, I believe it was, where we had tremendous flooding again in southwest Georgia, and we had state agencies that responded then. And I think. We learned how to work together as, a state, as state agencies then, and that helped us in the, in the Olympics that came along not long after that. This disaster was no, uh, was, was no uh, change from that. Uh, these agencies, the 11 that have contributed to the disaster response, so, and I just feel compelled to call their names this morning and to recognize them for their assistance. The Departments of Agriculture, Department of Community Supervision, Department of Corrections, Department of Defense, Department of Human Services, Department of Human Resources, Department of Public Health, Department of Public Safety, Department of Transportation, the agency we call GEMA, which has got a longer name now, and the State Forestry Commission. All of those responded with 
equipment with resources and 24-7 assistance and really, I think, uh, made our state proud. The largest piece of the governor's emergency fund is the state match of $20.5 million to match the $82 million in debris removal expenses that has been expended by the Corps of Engineers. Also coming out of the governor's emergency fund is a small amount, $1.98 million, that we're going to cover the local government's share of expenses and de debris removal and emergency protective measures. A lot of these communities spend a lot of money on overtime and on uh, providing services in these emergencies uh, uh, as they were without not only power but without uh, uh, communication and still are in some cases. Uh, so this was an extreme cost. They may be, uh, they may be receiving some compensation for this along the way federally, but it could be a year or two or three away. This keeps them in business and, and helps local governments from suffering. If you think about it too, the loss of income is something we haven't really talked about with local governments, but they, they're suffering a loss of income because of damage to businesses. Um, these storms have a terrific impact on, on, on the on business that people could do. I, I remember a, a, a something from the Katrina thing. There are so many things about Katrina that stick in my mind. One was that AT&T didn't receive a dollar of income for six weeks after Katrina hit. Just think about any business, and that, that will happen in businesses in, in southwest Georgia where they'll be out of business for a while. If they don't have power, in many cases, they some of them can't operate. So there's a terrific economic loss as well that, that we have to consider. So local governments will pay a, pay a price in many, many, many ways. Anything we can do to assist them, I think we sure need to do it. The Department of Transportation has expended some $31.5 million for debris removal and equipment and repairs and personnel costs. The state's 25% match of that is $7.9 million. Another piece of this disaster bill is $8.9 million for premiums to pay the state portion of liability coverage of damaged state properties. This goes to DOAS. We had just, ironically, we had just lowered the premiums by about this month, this amount uh, last year. So we're having to go back up because of the, the damage to, to state facilities as well. As you know, we're self-insured and then we have to cover our losses and then raise premiums on agencies to make up that difference. There's been a total of $23 million in damages uh, to state facilities as I mentioned earlier and uh, we've got to get that get that repaired and taken care of. The lar other large portion of disaster relief is going to the Georgia Development Authority for dispersal uh, of aid to farmers and timber timberland owners. There's a total of $55 million in this budget for disaster relief for Georgia farmers that were affected by Hurricane Michael. The Georgia Development Authority will administer this program, which will focus on trying to keep farmers in business for this next uh, planning year. Additionally, this $20 million for emergency disaster relief assistance as approved by the Georgia Forestry Commission for cleanup efforts for Georgia timberland owners and counties impacted by Hurricane Michael. There's about 2. Th listen to this, there's about 2.3 million acres that suffered either severe or catastrophic damage. That's not minimal damage or half damage, that's 75% damage or more catastrophic damage, 2.3 million acres. Just think about how, what, a, what a large area that is. In this bill is also $7.4 million for equipment replacement for the Georgia Forestry Commission. They've got about 600 pieces of equipment and uh, through this, content, this emergency and others, they, they're wearing out their equipment and this 770,000, excuse me, this 7.4 million will will help replace the aging out equipment that some of it's been perpetuated by this disaster. Additionally, for the Forestry Commission, the $770,000 to, uh, to build a consolidated forestry unit to replace the Miller and Early County forestry uh, locations that were damaged by the storm. So this, the, this will be a single location taking the place of two present county locations. It's gonna be located in Blaker, Georgia. I mentioned earlier the funds recognized by DOT, for DOT of motor fuel funds totaling $69.3 million that will assist the department 
and the expenditures they have spent in responding to cleaning up and recovery efforts by DOT. And these are only partially reimbursed by the federal government. These are motor fuel funds and not general revenue funds. And, fi and finally, <coughs> excuse me, there's $25 million for the One Georgia Authority for financial assistance to local communities uh, impacted by Hurricane Michael and for statewide economic development assistance and $15 million for the Regional Economic Business Assistance, or REBA, grants for projects with immediate statewide economic impact. Mr. President, that, that covers uh, the elements that are, that are in HB1EX. Um, we have uh, folks here who can answer questions, and I'll, I'll certainly attempt to answer any of them uh, that I can. Uh, you have a handout, I believe, on your desk that basically is where I got my information from for this for this uh, address this morning for this presentation. So, uh, anything that we can do to answer your questions, we'll do it now or or later. So, Mr. President, I'll open it up for questions. I don't think there are any questions, Senator. Thank you. If not, I urge urge your adoption of HB 1 EX, and let's get this aid on going to the citizens of Southwest Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Chair, can I, Senator from the 45th, speak to the bill? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to talk just a little bit about House Bill 1EX. And uh, I had to look up on Google because I couldn't even remember when the storm struck because it's been over a month now. And uh, I did look it up and it was on October the 10th. So here we are, you fast forward and you say to yourself, well, you had a disaster, you had a storm. Well, you get on with your life. I mean, we've gotten on with our lives. Here we are in special session. Everybody's getting ready for Thanksgiving next week. But it's kind of hard to get on with your life. And I'm grateful out of 11 million Georgians that there's 56 senators who truly, truly care. And you couldn't probably be further away from that disaster than up here representing metropolitan Atlanta in the northeast corner of Georgia. But it is in our hearts, and we do care, and we are doing something about it. And, and it's not just us. It's state workers, and that's a little bit about what I want to talk about. And I really didn't know, I'm very close to the senator from the 11th, and I'm even more closer to the senator from the 12th. And I oftentimes tell her I spend more time in her district. Now, you Democrats don't remember that. But I spend more time in her district than I do up there in my Republican district. Because if you look at the state of Georgia and you look at southwest Georgia and you look at the health care and you look at the metrics and where we fit in the whole United States, and you understand that Southwest Georgia has some of the worst, if not the worst, health parameters and statistics in the whole United States. So surely, surely, we do care. And surely, not just during a storm, but uh, every day of the year, we're talking about Southwest Georgia. We don't want to talk about them. We don't want to pick on them. We don't want to have to help them. But if the demand is there, we're there and we're Johnny on the spot. And what I wanted to talk about, my sister actually lives. And when I go down and visit these two senators and go to their districts for different stuff that I have to go to down there, my sister lives above uh, Panama City. And as we know, that's where the storm came through. Uh, they are in between Apalachicola. And she lives not too far from Thomasville and Bainbridge because when I go down there, it's about an hour away. So my sister lives in a trailer, and my sister didn't evacuate. And I've had to see the struggles that she has gone through. But more importantly, right next door to her, um, a Hispanic family lives in a trailer also in a big old pecan tree that they absolutely love. And you notice I say pecan because I spend a lot of time in South Georgia. I've learned not to say pecan. A big old pecan tree fell right through the middle of their trailer. And they uh, pick seasonal vegetables. 
and uh, they specialize in blueberries down there, picking blueberries. But they have a huge family. They have many kids in their family. The, the pecan tree went right through the middle of their trailer. Well, guess what? Over a month later, they're living in a tent. They have blue tarps. They're living in, in the field in between my sister's house and their trailer. They're hooking up their refrigerator and their freezer to my sister's power. They're running a, a water hose over to the little tent where they got going, and they're waiting on another trailer to be delivered, but they can't get one delivered because it's rained so much, and they can't get another trailer in to be able to provide for them. So we have been helping them, but, you know, it really struck home. When you talk about a disaster, you think about a big wide swath, but when you know someone personally, it really touches home because you're, you're thinking about that constantly. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is that southwest corridor and the highest infant and maternal mortality in the United States. So here we are trying to help a region, help an area, and then lo and behold, you have a disaster come in. And you have to wonder where that's going to move the goalpost. And we already know it's going to move the goalpost backwards. And it's going to take a whole lot of money millions and millions and millions to, to, to try and make a dent in the billions of dollars that have been lost. So I want to talk about DHS, Department of Human Services, and Department of Public Health. And when you start thinking about all this debris and how important it is, and I know we've been talking about the forestry, but when you talk about Bainbridge and Thomasville, and I've spent a lot of times in these little bitty cities I've spent a lot of time in Clay County. And you think about that debris removal. Well, the first thing, since I've been a former nurse, I thought about, you know, it's not very long until it starts getting warm down there because they're planting crops continuously. They won't plant them now. But as it gets warm, guess what you have? You have mosquitoes. And you know that if you don't remove that debris in these small towns and these small communities, that West Nile virus that we all hate and fear as spreading as an epidemic, this would be the perfect scenario if we don't clean up all that debris. So that's one of the first things. And you don't even think about those down ticket items when you start thinking about a big picture. But then when you get down and you start talking about mosquitoes, you understand how very, very important this is. So then the other thing I want to talk about other than public health and public health assuring, I know in the committee meeting they talked about potable water. They talked about the hospitals in Albany not having potable water. Do you know what potable water means to a hospital system when you have people on a ventilator? And when you're on a ventilator, this is the tube that goes down into your lungs. It has to be cleaned out. It has to be suctioned out. You have to have water. This is life-sustaining. You can talk about dehydration all you want, but I'm talking about hour to hour to hour you have to have water. This isn't to flush the commode and for sanitary conditions. This is for life sustainability, and you have to have it. So those are the type of things that DPH does, Department of Public Health. But I want to talk about defects and what defects does. And as we know, in the previous prior years under Commissioner Bobby Cagle, we increased the amount of money because we didn't have enough DFAX workers because DFAX workers actually qualified to be able to get on state food stamps. And that was a very sad situation. So we gave them a raise. So this is the lowest rung probably in state government on the salary scale, unfortunately. These are your caseworkers who actually take care of people. These are the people who do the grunt work. These are the people that are taking care of other people that are even less fortunate. And fortunately, defects, they've had, and they sent 300 staff workers immediately. These are people who were working in other areas that weren't affected by the disaster, and they went in, they swarmed in, and 300 workers have been working in that particular area. And they have not only been working during the day, they're not working the regular state hours, they're working till midnight. They're working on Saturday and Sunday. 
and they have done a yeoman's job, and that's why I'm standing here, is to say thank you to those state workers, those state workers who make the least money. They have processed over 27,000 applications so far. And these are applications, most importantly, for SNAP benefits. And if you don't know what SNAP is, that's food stamps in everyday terms. The most important thing, it doesn't do any good to get food stamps if you don't have a place to go and buy or purchase the food that you're eligible for. But that is part of the process is getting on the roll so that you can have emergency food. And that's very, very important. Those SNAP benefits so far have totaled $12 million in one-time benefits. That's not people. This is what government is for. Government is for when you need it. And when you need it is in an example of a disaster. These are people who have never been on entitlements before. But when that disaster strikes and you're working day to day and you're making your payments and you pay week to week to week, just like that trailer park people that I was talking about, my sister, you pay week to week. But what do you do the next week when you don't have an income like the chairman was talking about with the jobs program. The expectation, and I'm going to finish up, the expectation is for defects to process 50,000 applications. And that tells you how severe it is and what the storm is because these people are going to qualify. And fortunately, we have those workers down there with that ability. So what's the most important thing about this storm? We need to learn. We need to learn. Just like the senator from the 12th was telling us, her hospital in Albany needed potable water. They need wells dug so that during the next disaster, they don't have to face these same problems. And God forbid, you know, I've served a long time, and a lot of people in here have served a long time. What if, what if this disaster would have come during the recession? What if it would have struck in 2008, 2009, and 2010? God forbid, we never want a disaster. But if it would have struck when we had no rainy day fund, and that's exactly why the chairman is talking about being so prudent that we always have that rainy day fund, that we always have that accessibility because we never know when a disaster is going to strike. So the most important obligation and fiduciary responsibility to me is to learn and to listen to these senators in this area where it has been struck so that we can move forward so that if another disaster comes, like in Savannah or in northwest or northeast Georgia with tornadoes, that we know exactly what to do. So I implore you, I implore you, when we sit down at Thanksgiving dinner next week, when we sit down this next week, we're going and buying. I'm going and buying my turkey for 69 cents a pound, I hope, at Kroger. But, but let's think about these people. Let's think about these people. Let's think about these state workers that are going to be working on Thanksgiving Day. Let's think about this debris and these people that are picking up this debris on Thanksgiving Day and give our graces and say thank you, thank you God, that more people were not in that death toll. But also to answer the responsibility that yes, when we come back here in January, we are gonna be Johnny on the spot. We're not gonna forget when that uh, disaster struck in October, that we're gonna move forward, that we're gonna be better Georgians, and we're gonna be Georgians that stand together to answer the call when the call is out there. Thank you very much, I yield the well. Chair recognize Senator from the 13th. Thank you, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to say that uh, I, along with the senator from the 12th and the 11th, and I think they're going to have some things to say as well. Uh, all of our districts were, all our counties in our districts were affected by this storm. And uh, it all started, uh, first thing that happened is uh, people couldn't 
get out of their houses and so uh, getting chainsaws on the ground and getting getting trees cut up so we could get the roads cleared out was a, the first thing that we had to do and then we all were scrambling to find generators and I want to give a shout out to the electrical companies that came in Georgia Power the EMC's they worked very very hard to uh, restore power as quickly as possible and uh, we appreciate all their hard work <coughs> I want to thank the DOT local law enforcement state law enforcement that were on the scene that's what happens when these emergencies uh, situations take place that's the acute part of it and then um, you know again we start loaning generators to one another hey I got power so who needs a generator and uh, uh, there was a lot of that that was going around uh, the, the people of South Georgia came together after this storm or during this storm as we always do and uh, I was there in the flood of 94 and we had tornadoes uh, Senator Sims uh, Senator, the senator from the 12th had two tornadoes last January uh, uh, so we we've, we've been through a lot of things down there and the people come together and we work together but I also want to give a special shout out and I want to want you to recognize that what we do here matters if you recall last year we passed a law saying the Department of Corrections could go out with their uh, chainsaw crews immediately and start helping remove debris uh, one of my and, and they did that they did that this storm and and I called the uh, commissioner at one point of the Department of Corrections because one of my counties had requested some more help and uh, the commissioner and I talked and he said senator we got every crew every chainsaw everybody we can out working right now but we will do what we can to help that county that's called in particular because the most important thing is getting out the other thing uh, after you kind of get through the initial stage uh, you, you start looking at all the damage that the ag community was certainly very much affected and that's why we're here today that's that's one of the big reasons that we're looking at this bill and uh, and um, you know the cotton farmers in particular as you've heard and uh, I'll just leave you with this and I know the other senators want to say a few things and and uh, I want to say the people of South Georgia appreciate this special session and what we're doing here it matters it's very very important uh, and I am thankful as uh, the senator from the fourth pointed out that we are a state that's not having to say well how are we going to rob from Peter to pay Paul so that we can come up with this money uh, but but we are looking at uh, using some some money that we have in a in a surplus uh, to, to or that would have went to surplus to uh, be able to do this that's a good position to be in I want to keep Georgia in that position uh, last thing I'll say is uh, the senator that was just here was talking about uh, pecan trees uh, I started to correct the governor the other day he called them pecan trees also in South Georgia they're called pecans when we're when we're buying them but they're pecans when we're selling them so y'all just keep that in mind but uh, we certainly appreciate all the support I, I sure hope you you'll all vote in favor of this bill thank you very much I yield the well chair recognize senator from the 12th senator from the 12th Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak to HB 1EX and to also thank my colleagues for all of the calls, all of the um, aid that you sent to Southwest Georgia, and the real concern that you had for us. But let me just also give you bird's eye view of what we are dealing with still in Southwest Georgia. We also lost millions of chickens. There were little biddies running around, nowhere to go, and they were going to die because there was no feed for them or water. Those little biddies and chickens had to be corralled, placed in a pit, and buried because they were no longer good for market. We had one farmer alone that lost over 30,000 pecan trees. And I say pecan because my mother would have a fit if I said anything else. She was a proper 
southern lady. Over 30,000 pecan trees. Our timber industry was decimated, and it will take years for that timber to be recouped, for the industry to recoup. Our schools lost instructional time that will never, that these children will never be able to recoup. Utilities were lost for weeks, not days. There is a doctor in Clay County with the little rundown doctor's office that was a part of that utility lost, Dr. Karen Kenzel. And Dr. Kenzel called and said, I don't have, I said, well, let me, let me call Georgia Power. So we were able to get Clay County back online, but Dr. Kenzel's office, because of the age of that building, they couldn't give her electricity because if they had, it would have burned the entire building down. That's how old and rickety it is. So she had to call in an electrician to take care of whatever was needed in the building prior to getting the electricity turned on. I want to thank my Lieutenant Governor for serving Southwest Georgia even before this emergency. He was always there when we called him. And so was the Senator from the 45th. Always, whenever we needed the Lieutenant Governor to come down. And Lieutenant Governor, the, the back porch is still standing. Where is he? <laughs> I said the, the back porch is still standing. Still standing. Our Marine Corps logistics base was hit once again. And this is uh, one of the largest, it is the largest supply chain for the Marines, for the, the military corps in the United States. And again, we're having to, uh, the federal government is going to have to uh, once again go in and rebuild and take care of the losses to the base. There are so many other stories that we can tell. But I just want to thank you all for all that you've done and continue to do. It will take years, not days, not months, for us to be able to be made whole again or to achieve normalcy. But Southwest Georgia is resilient and we will again become a vibrant community. But the, the senator from the 11th mentioned a few minutes ago, we're going to lose population because these people will have no homes to go to. They won't be able to afford uh, to build new ones. They don't have insurances. So it's very, very, we're at a very crucial and pivotal point in Southwest Georgia. Continue to pray for us. Don't forget us. And we are here because I know that you are sincere about, and the governor's office especially, about what happens and that we do matter in Southwest Georgia. Because there are instances when we really do feel lost and thrown away. But I always remind my folks that you have a legislature that cares. You have an executive branch that cares. And we're going to be made whole again. So thank you so very, very much, all of you, for your continuous attention to those of us that live in Southwest Georgia. Thank you very much. Chair, recognize Senator from the 11th. He'll be the final speaker on the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. 
And I've, I've risen several times uh, this week, and so I'll, I'll keep my r remarks brief. Uh, but I do want to, again, thank the governor, uh, the speaker, and, of course, our president for their leadership this week in, in uh, dealing with this very serious uh, issue. I want to thank the senator for the fourth for his uh, remarks. Uh, they, they certainly uh, touched my heart, and I know they did the, the, the people back home. Uh, I want to want to bring up just a few points. It, when, I, when I woke up this morning, and I've been waking up 4.30 to 5 o'clock this week for some weird reason, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's got, got something to do with what we've been dealing with here. Um, but uh, it might surprise some of you, but when I wake up, first thing I do is uh, click on Facebook. And, and it's not because I care anything about uh, social media in general uh, or what's happening in the, in the political world, but my kids tend to p post pictures of my grandkids from what they did the night before, and that's what I look at first thing in the morning. Uh, I think the lieutenant governor would probably understand that. Uh, but this morning when I clicked on, the first picture was a, was a power pole. And it was posted by one of my constituents right outside their trailer, but you could see the blue tarp on the, on the side of it. And they said, yay, I got a power pole. They didn't have, a, have power yet, because it was just a pole. But this, as the Senator 45th said, is you know five or six weeks later, and we still have people who are celebrating the fact that they had a pole stuck in their yard. I think that uh, brought it home as to, as to why it is important for us to remember why we're here, that, that there are still people in my area hurting, uh, the economy down there will probably never recover from this blow. I'm, I've, I've resigned myself to that. We're going to have farmers who are going to lose their farms over this because they're already in debt from the last couple of years of uh, low commodity prices. We had a, a, a storm last year that, that unfortunately was at this exact same cotton picking time, and, and many of our cotton farmers lost their crop last year, and, and two years in a row is just devastating. Uh, the amount of money that, that we're putting towards the farmers, $55 million, sounds like a lot of money, but, but in our world of, of, uh, uh, of agriculture, that's a drop in the bucket, and it's only going to help a tiny percentage of the people who are hurting. It's a start, and we look for our federal government to, to match that money and, and certainly want to ask you guys to, to use your leverage with members of Congress to make sure that they're fighting for Georgia in our time of need. And I want to ask you personally, when we come back into session uh, in January, that we make this also a priority, that we res reassess the gaps that, that we identify and find out what it is that we can do uh, better. I know in our world of, of medicine, uh, we, we do uh, uh, a lot of uh, research when we have a bad outcome. We call it a root cause analysis. We try to figure out what went wrong. And we've already identified in our facility many things that we need to do to be better prepared in the future. We found out that our kitchen uh, in, in our hospital that, that serves our, our patients, and we average about 30 patients a day in our, our acute care facility, we have uh, 110 uh, patients in our nursing home. That we have to feed those folks three meals a day. We have 400 employees that we have to feed every day. We found out that the, the uh, the generator power that is there to keep the, the, the respirators going, and it's there for those critical things, but uh, the refrigeration in our kitchen was not powered. That was something in the past when we've had power outages, it was an hour or two hours, three hours at the most. We never had power outage for two, three days like we did with this storm. Miller um, Seminole County Hospital had power outage, I think, close to a full week. Uh, so these are things that we've got to invest in the infrastructure to make sure we can feed these p patients that are uh, laying in their beds and don't have, this is their home. They don't have any place to go when you're in a nursing home. That being said, there were no headlines, no headlines about people in nursing homes dying like occurred in hurricanes in Florida last year. Our people stepped up and did what they had to do to take care of our patients. And Public Health and the Georgia Hospital Association deserve a lot of credit because they've been working for years on being prepared for these kind of disasters.
and they uh, came out looking very well. But this kind of storm identifies the weaknesses. And if we don't learn from those weaknesses, then we've wasted an opportunity. So again, I would uh, ask you to uh, keep these people in your thoughts and your prayers during the next holiday season because a lot of them are not going to really have a holiday. I ask you to uh, uh, keep your hearts in mind and pocketbook open when we come back into session uh, next year and, and see what else we need to do to try to uh, make sure that these people who are very prideful, uh, as the Senator from 45th mentioned, that there were people waiting in line in the rain circled around the building for those DSAP SNAP uh, programs because they had no food to eat and no money to buy. And these are people who have never gotten anything in their life for free. But they were asking for help because they didn't know what else to do. So these, these programs that we're talking about are very meaningful and I appreciate all the support individually you guys have given me this week and for the past five weeks and I appreciate uh, every one of you, and I hope every one of you have a, uh, a great new year and, and holiday season. But just, again, as you're enjoying time with your family, please take a moment and think about those that are, that are suffering. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead with the script. That concludes the debate. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Agree on a port of committee which fail will pass the bill. Chairs none, port of committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? I think the question is chair, not, here's none, and, and the main question is order. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary and like the machine. Great, great uh, tribute. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 52 and the nays are zero. And this bill, I have a constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Senator from the 11th, what purpose you rise? Pardon me, inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, is it not true that the House couldn't uh, have a unanimous vote on this issue and my senators came through in, the, in, a, in a pinch? Absolutely. Led the way, as usual. As always, Senate leading the way, Senate leading the way. Thank you, Senator. Secretary will read House Bill 4EX. House Bill 4EX by Representative Rose of the 120th, Powell of the 171st, Rogers and Rogers of the 110th. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 7 of Title 48 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to the imposition, rate, computation, and exemptions from income taxes so as to create a tax credit for certain taxpayers based on certain expenses incurred due to Hurricane Michael and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Finance recommends the bill do pass. Mr. President, that completes the order. Is that the idea?
Chair recognizes the senator from the 20th present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, we live in, in divisive times, and we have a, an environment, unfortunately, where uh, groups are trying to divide us, uh, rural versus urban, uh, Democrats versus Republicans, et cetera. But I've never been more proud of the Georgia State Senate that we are standing as one in one Georgia for our, our friends that are hurting in southwest Georgia. So I'm very, very proud of that unanimous vote. I'm here to talk about the uh, more long-term impact of Hurricane Michael. Uh, House Bill 1EX gives some immediate relief, but the Hurricane Michael, as we all know, is a generational disaster, uh, particularly when it comes to timberland and, and pecan growers. Uh, so House Bill 1EX is more of the immediate need. This deals with more of a long-term need. Georgia leads the nation in private timberland acreage. It's a, it's a huge industry in Georgia. Uh, as the chairman of appropriations already told you, uh, Hurricane Michael impacted 2.4 million acres of timberland and pecan uh, farms. Uh, very, very devastating. What House Bill 4EX does is provide for a $200 million, 100% refundable tax credit for those that are, suffered a casualty loss from Hurricane uh, Michael. There are 28 counties that are eligible for this tax credit, and that's the 28 counties that were in the Declaration of Disaster for Individual Assistance. If any of you all need to know what counties they are, I have a, a chart here, but it's the, the swath that Hurricane Michael came up through. Uh, pecan trees are, are included in this, as well as uh, hardwood and pine trees. I've, I've been told if you're selling uh, if you're buying, it's pecan, and if you're selling, it's pecans. So it depends on what side you are on that. In order to be eligible for the credit, you have to show a, uh, that you are actively growing uh, trees for a commercial venture or for a business, and you have to show a loss between October 9, 2018 and December 31st, 2018. You have to be in those 28 counties. The tax credit is capped $400 per acre. It is transferable one time, but the replanting has to be in the county where the loss occurred. The idea behind this is to encourage uh, replanting and reforestation. I think that I've hit the high points on this. I know you all have studied this and understand it, but I welcome any any questions you may have and I I don't think there are any questions so I'm ready no questions senator yes I ask for your favorable consideration thank you does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed on the committee? Which fail pass the bill? Chairs none. Porter the committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put in objection? Chairs none. Main question is ordered. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine.
on the passage of the bill, the yeas are 52 and the nays are zero. And this bill, having received Rev's Constitution, majority is therefore adopted. <laughs> Secretary will read House Bill 5EX. House Bill 5EX by Representative Rhodes of the 120th, Powell of the 171st, and Rogers of the 110th. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 8 of Title 48 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to sales and use taxes so as to ratify an executive order of the governor suspending the collection of sales and use tax levied on jet fuel for a period of time to provide for the continuance of such suspension of collection indefinitely to exempt jet fuel from certain sales and use taxes to provide a definition to repeal provisions limiting an exemption from such taxes and for other purposes. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Appropriations recommends this bill do pass. Floor Amendment 1 by Senator Heath of the 31st and others, who offers the following amendment. Amend the substitute to House Bill 5EX by replacing June 30, 2019 with December 31st, 2018 on line 126. Mr. President, that completes the order. Chair and I, Senator of the 20th, present the bill. Thank you for that previous vote. We are here, of course, to provide disaster relief and aid to Southwest Georgia, the, uh, and I'm proud of our efforts in that regard. The state constitution, however, requires us to uh, address any executive orders between the last time we meet, we met. So we are, this bill uh, addresses Governor Dill's executive order to uh, w uh, suspend the collection of fuel, uh, jet fuel tax. Uh, under Governor Deal's uh, brilliant leadership, his, his uh, steadfast leadership, Georgia has been named the number one, number one state in which to do business for six consecutive years in a row. We've been able to grow this state's economy by over 750,000 jobs. A big part of the reason we've been able to be successful in this area is because we have a, a low tax burden on businesses uh, to help create these jobs, but we lag the country in this respect with our the way we tax our jet fuel. In fact, we have the fourth highest fuel tax burden among the 21 states. Uh, this bill will uh, ratify his executive order. It moves the jet fuel tax into the same code section as the motor fuel tax, which uh, makes it where the governor cannot exempt it again without an uh, uh, declaration of emergency and it would require a two-thirds uh, vote then to ratify that. Um, this, the tax burden, it puts us at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other states, North Carolina, Texas, New York, and we live in a global economy where global transportation is vital to our economy. Um, I know there's been some concern about what about our more rural and smaller airports, and we've had a good bit of discussion within the, the majority caucus about this, and I'm, I'm standing here today to commit to you that we're not going to forget about our rural airports. We are going to talk about this next year and come with an aggressive package to uh, fully fund their infrastructure needs and be supportive of our, our rural airports. Uh, I know you all have studied this also, debated it at length. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Otherwise, I ask for your favorable vote on House Bill 5EX. Senator from the 41st, you have a question. Speak. 21st. Speak. Question. Mr. President, is it not true that since the governor's executive order was signed, that one of our airlines has added six routes to enhance economic development in the state of Georgia? Thank you for that question, Senator. That's absolutely true. We anticipate if we ratify this that we're going to see more routes added. Uh, Senator from the 53rd, wish to be recognized. You are recognized this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator you? Yes, sir. Senator, isn't it not true that I am an economic developer? That's true. Okay. 
Isn't it not true that I have taken classes and courses that prove by certification that I am an economic developer? Yes, sir. You're very, very uh, well renowned in your field. Well rounded. Right? Thank you. <laughs> That's not funny. Isn't it uh, true that I think and I know this bill is all about economic development for the people of Georgia? Yes, sir. Isn't Absolutely. it not true? that I also believe that this is a tax cut and would be a conservative position to vote yes. That is correct. A vote yes is a tax cut. The, um, are there any other senators wishing to qu ask a question? There are a number of, all right, Senator from the 26th, you're recognized this time. There are a number of lights on is why I'm asking. I don't, I'm not sure who wants the floor and who wants to ask a question. Will the senator yield? Yes, sir. Uh, senator, uh, vote for this. Uh, would that mean that we could get a rap in the Macon Middle Georgia Airport now? It would certainly help. Chances and, uh, are getting better. Chances are getting better. This this bill also includes a, a sunset provision. Uh, it will sunset June 30th, 2019. Um. Senator from the 29th, you wish the floor have the floor, and the 44th, you wish to have the floor. All right, no further questions, sir. Thank you. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Chair recognizes the senator from 41st. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I want to briefly rise on this important legislation. You know, we look at uh, the jet fuel tax, and we know it is a source of revenue in our state between 44 and 49 million dollars. And we know that that revenue helps, gives our teachers salaries, builds our infrastructure. You know, the airports need roads to get to them, need water lines, need infrastructure. We know it's important that we have revenue to do things for our state. We also know that in this case, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the uh, jet fuel revenue for years because back in the late 80s, uh, there was a raise of the state uh, sales tax that went up a penny. By federal statute, we should have dedicated that money to aviation. It wasn't always done. So there's been a lot of unreadiness. The governor told Delta basically that we were going to suspend collection of this tax. I think us as a legislative body should provide our clientele, our businesses and citizens with some logic, with some something that they can make expectations and, and build their business plan or personal plans around. He made this promise, so therefore I support this legislation to suspend the collection and forgive that, that, that uh, tax collection as the bill states. So I support that through June. I also appreciate the bill's uh, refinements of the process so the, the governor, you know, is not doing this again unless there's a state of emergency, and I appreciate those efforts in the bill. So I fully support the bill today. I'm just getting up to rise to you that this body, all of us, Democrats and Republicans, supported Senate Bill 378, which required us to look more closely as we do tax cuts in the future. And I think we should go forward. I think when we do tax cuts, we realize any tax cut can be used for, uh, it can be stated that it's for economic development. We could cut motor fuel taxes at UPS and say it's for economic development. But everything should be studied. We know this is a significant amount of money. We know that teachers for a 1% raise in Georgia would need about $75 million. We know we haven't given them the raises over the last more than a decade and that we are way behind in fulfilling that commitment to them. So what I am rising to say is that when we come back in January, we're not guaranteeing uh, the jet fuel tax continue. And what I'm asking each of you to do is make sure the processes are in place for a very extensive analysis, comparing our taxes to other states' taxes, our uh, jet fuel and aviation needs compared to what other states have as far as infrastructure and our needs on it, and that when we come back during the regular session, we again visit this issue 
which I know you're, you're all aware about, but I wanted to inform our constituents that we're going to be looking hard at this in the future as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Chair recognizes Senator from the 44th, 44th at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President and members of the Senate, I rise today to voice my support for House Bill 5EX. This legislation is the result of the compromise by all stakeholders. As you all well know, jet fuel taxation has a complicated history in this state. The issue most concerns me is revenue for Clayton County and in particular, Clayton County Public Schools. I am pleased to say that after working with all interested parties, I, along with the rest of the Clayton County delegation, have protected local revenues from the sale of jet fuel. This will allow the county to continue to provide services expected by residents of my district. Additionally, this legislation is important to keep Georgia's economy competitive. Many states do not collect taxes on jet fuel, which means that airlines are more likely to schedule flights where they can fill up cheaper. As home to the world's busiest airport, Hartsville-Jackson International Airport, Georgia needs to ensure that we remain competitive with other states that have major airport hubs. Any shift in airline operations away from Hartsville-Jackson will have a far more significant impact on the state's economy than the loss of jet fuel revenues. This legislation also contains a very important restriction on executive orders related to jet fuel tax suspensions. While I understand the governor's decision to suspend the tax after last year's political snafu, these sorts of decisions should be done by the legislature. Contained in this bill is a provision that would make suspending jet fuel taxes work the same as suspending motor fuel taxes. The taxes could only be suspended in the case of a declared emergency. And to per permanently forgive the tax liability, the legislator would have to ratify the executive order by a two-thirds supermajority, not just a simple majority. Those are important protections to ensure that the legislature retains its control over the state revenue. Finally, the primary recipient of this benefit will be Delta Airlines, which has been a long-term asset for the region. Well, Delta is Georgia's largest private employer with more than 33,000 employees statewide, many living in Clayton County. It is also Georgia's largest corporate charitable donor contributing $12 million a year to charities across this state, and that's important to me. In conclusion, the most important aspect of this bill is that all parties involved have been extremely respectful to Clayton County's needs and protected its local revenue in this bill. With my constituents protected and the other economic benefits from maintaining a strong air travel industry, I think this bill is a positive bill for Georgia and Georgia's economy. Mr. President, if there are no questions, I yield the well. No questions, Thank Senator. You. Chair recognize Senator the 29th, 29th to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, none of us asked to be here in special session today on a Saturday morning, but here we are. I think I'd like to begin by just sharing with you one of my favorite films. 
It's the Shawshank Redemption. I don't know if you've ever seen the Shawshank Redemption, but it takes place in a prison in Maine. And there's a character in the film named Red, played by Morgan Freeman. His real name is Ellis Redding. Now, Red is in prison for life, but he has the possibility of parole. And there are three parole hearings you see as the film plays out. One takes place in 1947, one in 1957, and one in 1967. And in the first two hearings, he tries to say what he thinks the parole board wants to hear so they'll turn him loose. And, of course, it gets denied both times. And then finally, he has his third hearing. He's been in prison for over 30 years. And that's probably not appropriate for me to quote what he says in the movie, but he's very blunt uh, with the parole board at that time. Um, and they actually grant his release. I've often wondered about that scene in the film and why he bothered to go to the third parole hearing because he clearly thought that the fix was in. But at the end of the film, Red talks about hope and enduring hope. And I think when he went there that third and final time, there was some small part of him that was hoping he might win his freedom. And in answering that question, uh, or telling you that story, I answered a question that some of you may have about why uh, I would speak to this bill today. Uh, minds have probably been made up at this point, um, and why I would be as blunt as I intend to be today. Uh, but it's because I hold out some hope that uh, even though in the uh, eight years I've served here, I've generally supported the governor when he was right, which was more often, much more often than when he was wrong. Um, but on a handful of occasions, I have opposed special tax breaks for special interests or favored industries. And my opposition has continued, even though I've never seen the governor fail to pass a bill in this chamber that he was supporting in the eight years I've served and that the outcome of the vote is usually similar to a basketball game between the Harlem Globetrotters and the Washington Generals, usually not very close. But I, like Red, hold out some small hope that this time might be different. When I learned about the plan call for a special session by reading a news report which discussed hurricane relief funding, I asked myself, what is the real reason we are being called into special session? Because while I certainly support the work that was done here this week and today in the Senate, and I think it's unlikely the public at large realizes this, there are procedures in place for emergency funding to be allocated without calling the legislature into session. And indeed, that is why we have compiled a balance of over $2 billion into the rainy day account. The tragedy that has befallen South Georgia clearly qualifies as a justifiable circumstance to use some of the rainy day funds. But if we aren't here to vote on hurricane relief, which could have been handled without calling a special session, why then were we being called into special session? And it became clear reading the call that was issued that we were here to have another round of debate over the jet fuel tax break. I have opposed this measure from the beginning. I think that's an important point to make. Um, regardless of the relationships of private airlines and uh, political organizations, that doesn't really have anything to do with it. It shouldn't enter into the analysis. Bad public policy is bad public policy. The legislature that will be seated in January should be deciding this question. And calling this session was a mistake. But as I said, we are here and we are here uh, being asked to resolve the question, so let's get to it. To understand my opposition to this measure, I need to spend a few minutes discussing our public policy on fuel taxes more generally. In 2015, some members here will remember when the administration asked the legislature to raise $900 million in revenue, including raising the gasoline tax and imposing a $5 per night hotel motel tax. We were told at that time from this well multiple times that it was absolutely necessary to raise this revenue to improve our ailing infrastructure, our roads and bridges, and that motorists and travelers should be the ones to pay for these improvements and upgrades. While I disagreed with the amount of taxes being levied, it was hard to argue with the proposition that the users of the system should pay for the system. Now this same administration 
is asking the legislature to end the tax on jet fuel in our state. I'll come back to the sunset, but for today's purposes, we're ending the collection of jet fuel taxes in our state. Federal law requires that the revenue generated by this tax be spent on aviation infrastructure. Many of us have airports in our districts. I can tell you in District 29, we have, of course, the airport in Columbus that has commercial service, but we also have LaGrange Calloway Airport, the Harris County Airport, and Roosevelt Memorial Airport in Warm Springs. During my eight years as a senator, I have gone uh, multiple times to request funding for uh, runway improvements, lengthening the runway, adding hangar space. These are not inexpensive endeavors. And some of you may not know this, but there are over 100 uh, general aviation uh, airports in our state. There are a lot of needs for those airports in our state. The viability of the airports I'm describing in my district are critical for economic development in my district. It is absolutely necessary for recruitment of new economic development prospects and to maintain employers important in communities I represent. So as you consider the economic development argument, remember commercial and general aviation airports in our state and the vital role they play in our economy. It's definitely part of the climate that has made our state the number one state in which to do business. And the revenue generated by this tax should be dedicated so it is available fully for this critical component of our transportation infrastructure. While much has been said regarding the 40 million generated in state tax, there is roughly another 25 million collected by local communities. This leads me to my next question which is if we do what is proposed before us today, how will we pay for airport infrastructure going forward? The answer is we will pay for it out of the general fund. Who pays for the general fund? Of course, that would be all Georgia taxpayers. So let me share stories with you of two such taxpayers. Last week, I had lunch with a friend of mine in Columbus at Red Lobster. As we had our lunch, we had the occasion to visit with our waitress. We learned she was a single mother with three children. She works two jobs, and she's working incredibly hard to provide for her family without asking the government for a handout. Now, she gets in her car every day to drive from home to work, from home to getting her kids from child care. She's got to drive a car. She's paying her taxes. This morning, I took Uber to the Capitol. My Uber driver was telling me about her Thanksgiving travel plans. Her extended family lives in Miami, Florida, and she's traveling there for the holiday. She cannot afford to fly, so she's driving there. She too is working two jobs to make ends meet. I want to mention one other group of taxpayers, and those are the family members I see routinely who come to Columbus to celebrate a proud moment when their child graduates from infantry school at Fort Benning. And when we welcome them to Columbus, we require them to pay a $5 per night tax on a $40 per night hotel room. So why not, excuse me, these, these people are Georgia taxpayers. They are paying at the pump and they are paying sales taxes at a minimum. These people are representative of millions of Georgians who we are asking today by passing this bill to subsidize the operation of an industry they cannot even afford to utilize. More routes to more places or marginally lower fares don't help them one bit. So why not some tax relief for these ladies or the families I mentioned on the fuel tax they pay? Why are we asking people who live paycheck to paycheck to pay this tax while exempting an entire industry from paying fuel taxes during a time of record profits. I would say the reason for this disparate treatment is that these people I've been talking about this morning are the forgotten men and women of our country who President Trump talked about in his inaugural address. These people cannot afford to hire a trade group to put a, thank you, to put a letter on our desks, a letter like this one that you may have seen. These people cannot afford to hire someone who used to work for the governor to advocate on their behalf because they are spending every free moment taking care of their children 
and working to pay the bills and to hold their families together. I submit to you that our focus should be on the forgotten men and women, not special interests looking for a sweetheart deal. It is my hope, as I've shared these thoughts with you today, oh, I'm sorry, if this is good public policy, why are we sunsetting it in seven months from now? What will change between today and two months from now when the newly seated legislature takes office? If you believe this is good policy today, then it should be sunset several years out, not seven months out. Now, having uh, said all of this, I am willing to compromise. I am willing to support the bill with the amendment offered by the senator from the 31st. I don't like it, but it would avoid the confusion of collecting taxes retroactively and end this practice definitively on December 31st. This is a reasonable compromise on what I find to be an otherwise distasteful measure. I do want to say a brief word to my friends in the minority caucus who have supported measures similar to this one in the past. It is difficult to take your calls for more spending on Medicaid, transit, and education seriously when you support corporate welfare like this bill before us today. It is my hope that even if I fail in my effort today, that I will have honored the commitment I made eight years ago and that our president made two years ago to fight for the forgotten men and women of our country with every breath in my body to ensure they will be forgotten no longer. I know others in good faith in this chamber may disagree with me today, but I hope that my service will be remembered in fighting for those without a voice and my vocal opposition to this measure is in keeping with that tradition. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Shawshank in 1995 was beat out by Forrest Gump. The movie of was a movie of the year. So, best picture. Who do you think knows Georgia best? Forrest Gump. Chair recognize Senator from the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I, I rise on a different note than the Senator from the 29th. I appreciate the call uh, of the governor to tackle matters that face Southwest Georgia. I appreciate the call of the governor to tackle matters that have faced uh, folks who are just to the west of me in the state who are experiencing incredible difficulties. And, and I appreciate that call here today because I know that that benefits 10 and a half million Georgians. I do though separate myself, I agree with him partly though, although I separate myself from him on that, with, on this bill. We're here to represent 10 and a half million Georgians. We're here to represent 177,000 people who call where we do home. And this bill, I do not see where that helps the 10 and a half million Georgians that we represent as a whole, and particularly the 70, 177,000 that I represent back in Southeast Georgia. You see, this bill also, while it takes 39 million from state funds, it also takes about 26 million from local funds. And of those 26 million from local funds, 6 million roughly are not in Hartsville. They're spread around our state. To my communities, to Jeff Davis County, that's about $3,000. To Toombs County, it's about $6,000. To Wayne County, it's about $3,000 as well. And while I've been told and while I do understand those dollar figures are low, their percentage of their airport budget is actually pretty high. That's a, a whole percent of, of their airport budget in Jeff Davis. That's a little bit over that in Toombs. It's almost 2% in Wayne County. And some people may still say, well, those percentages are low too. They don't matter. Well, if they don't matter, then $40 million dollars to a company with profits of $5 billion, well, that's only 0.4% or 25% less than that. Those are the percentages in my counties, but those aren't the only ones affected. 
Gwinnett County sees a local effect on this bill of $95,000 a year. Glenn County, $119,000 a year. Richmond, $281,000 a year. DeKalb, $718,000 a year. Albany, an area that we're here to help because it's been destroyed by, form, by storms, $46,000 a year. I've asked the Secretary of the Senate if they would key up a map if they have it. And that's a map, I know it's sort of hard to see, but those are your airports. Those are the areas you represent. Those areas will see a deduction as well, not just of the 39 or $40 million of state funds, but of local funds as well. And we've heard the argument that the FAA requires this. Well, there's ways to tailor that. We know there are. I'm resigned. I understand that I may be in the minority today on my vote. But we may come back and affect this again next year. And I would ask that I'll tell you there are ways that we can make sure that this bill would benefit the 177,000 I represent and the 11 million, 10 and a half million that all of us collectively represent. The senator from the 22nd talked about this. The senator from the 41st echoed it about making sure these tax breaks work for all Georgians. The senator from the 21st talked about more flights. The senator from the 26th talked about flights out of regional airports. But none of those things are here and included or guaranteed in this bill. You see, if we wanted to make sure those 10 and a half million people were also benefiting, we would reduce taxes on something else, find another way to reduce those taxes. We could find ways to support those local airports where we're taking that $6 million out on local money. We could treat this like we do other economic development projects and tie it to a minimum number of jobs so that we aren't facing a threat that other jobs leave our area every year when we, general, when we gather in this General Assembly. We could tie that credit to a number of flights out of regional airports, out of Columbus, out of Valdosta, out of Macon, Brunswick, or Albany. We could also tie that rate or that credit to something novel completely outside the box. We could create and make sure it benefits all 10 and a half million Georgians by creating a new group rate. Isn't that what got us here to begin with, a group rate? What if that new group rate, though, was not for the AARP or for any other entity, but it was citizen of Georgia? And if you booked your flight and you used your address as Georgia, that you got that lowest group rate in exchange for the tax credit going to these commercial carriers. It's just something we want to think about for next time. Now, I understand that I've made my decision on what I think this does to the 177,000 people I represent, and that each of you now get to make the decision on how you think it affects the 177,000 that you represent. Thank you, Mr. President. If there are no questions, I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Chair, recognize Senator from the 31st to speak to his amendment. Mr. President, members of the Senate, I have uh, hopefully will be able to combine uh, my thoughts on the bill as a whole and, and the amendment. The amendment is very simple. I think you can uh, comprehend what that does. Um, I had placed on your desk an information packet, and um, it's a lot of information. <coughs> I just wanted to briefly kind of tell you what, what's in this. Uh, first page is a, is a list of jet fuel prices that I put together yesterday. And there's an average at the end, you will s see the average of all of them, $4.52. And then as you, as you dig down a little bit deeper, I've broken this out by different categories of airports. And what you'll find when you get down to level one, there's a lot of empty blanks. Those are because we have airports that do not sell jet fuel. Now why might, I, might they choose to not sell jet fuel? It's because the runways are not long enough to get an airplane in there or enough different types of aircraft in there that consumes jet fuel. Georgia has, I believe, 109 airports, general aviation airports. Um, I think it's important that we support those. And to get on through the handout, the very last page is a study that I conducted back in February of this year when we were talking about this issue then. And what we found is that for me, living in West Georgia, I can go to Birmingham and get on an airplane 
fly to Atlanta and get on the same airplane that you would board in Atlanta, only the airlines, this is a, this is one particular airline, um, they'll actually pay me to get on in Birmingham and then they'll fly me to Atlanta. It's cheaper, the, the first kind of grayed out column you get to the bottom, you know, the total of this was some of these flights, some $3,500 cheaper to get on flights outside this state to get to the airport to get on the flight that goes where you want to go. So I wondered what happens whenever you cut a minimal amount of tax on fuel from the cost. You would expect the ticket prices would go down and reflect that. And in fact, they do. Ticket prices have gone, you'll see the comparison if you go left or right on the page, you'll see that these flights have gotten quite a bit cheaper. But they've gotten much more cheaper if you get on that flight from somewhere other than Georgia. My point is <coughs> the people that pay this tax are at the, at the mercy of market conditions. The vendors of these flights will charge all they can get by with um, for the market that they're in. Now some have said that this is a tax cut and while you can say that the consumer pays all taxes, a study of ticket prices as I said point out that it's cheaper to get on flights other places. And then I ask you who's going to maintain our avi aviation infrastructure? If we continue the tax on jet fuel, it is the users of this system that pays for the maintenance of, of our airports. And our airports are very important. If we don't tax the users of that system, and if we do what some have so eloquently stated that they will support funding our airports, then that means that we've got to take those funds from other things like health care and education that dominates the bulk of our budget. Some have said our, our jet fuel tax puts Georgians at a competitive disadvantage to other states. Well, clearly that's not reflected in the ticket prices for flights originating in Georgia. It's good for economic development. If that's so, Consider what the, an elimination of the hotel motel tax would do to make Georgia a welcoming state. According to GDOT, there is some $2 billion needed in, over the next 10 years for development and maintenance of Georgia's aviation resources. If we were able to totally leverage the federal dollars, and, and the best match you get is a 90-10 split, we would need $200 million over the next 10 years to support our airports. Now I will remind you that you can't get that 90% match on, on all the projects that we need. Imagine what an infusion of $200 billion in construction and engineering work in this state would do. That would employ people all across this state. According to GDOT's statewide airport economic impact study, more than 82,000 people are directly employed at Georgia's airports with a payroll of over $5.9 billion. Attracting international and out-of-state companies to our state will require an airport assist system that can accommodate those corporate aircraft that their executives and management personnel fly in. Let me also point out that Georgia has some 4,800 based aircraft here. That's a tremendous amount of income for local governments in ad valorem tax. Those airplanes, for the most part, are based at airports. I'll also, uh, there's been some allusion to, or some hint of, companies that manufacture aircraft in this state and that they might support this elimination of fuel tax. Well, I can tell you that if you manufacture an aircraft, of course you put some fuel in them to test them out and to demonstrate them and all those kind of things. 
But that aircraft is of no use to you if there's not an airport that you can land that airplane in. Now there's one, well there are some major um, air carriers in this state. One of which um, had a press release on October the 24th stating that it had paid dividends to its shareholders for the 22nd consecutive quarter. This particular airline, according to their news releases on their website, purchased a refinery in 2012 for $150 million and in 2015 we're expecting $300 million in revenue from that $150 million investment. <coughs> now, we're all about helping those who need help the most. This particular airline um, In 2015, the AJC reported it had paid out nearly five billion dollars in profit sharing in the past five years. And of course, if they paid dividends for 22 consecutive quarters, their shareholders benefit as well. Now some have said, why would we want a 1231 date? Well, there is some logistics to re-implementing the system of collecting and remitting this tax that we should be collecting from the users of the system and this would give them a little bit of time while still collecting the taxes to support our um, aviation infrastructure. Let me also point out if you've taken time to look at the physical note on this it says the physical impact is some 45 to 50 million dollars in a year based on two dollar and seventeen cent a gallon jet fuel. If you look at the numbers I provided you, you will see that that's not the case today. That this would be double that. Now admittedly an airline that has its own refinery, I'm not sure how we tax that. Do we tax it on the raw products that goes into the manufacture of jet fuel or do we tax them at the rate that everyone else would pay? So my request is, and while I support much of the measures in the bill that's before you, I think that we should collect this jet fuel tax and invest in this very valuable infrastructure that this state has. And I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't point out According to GDOT, we have invested in our airports less than any state that joins us. I, sp I spoke to some yesterday. I am a pilot, full disclosure. I have over the last couple of years had several occasions where I needed to fly into South Carolina to conduct some business. And folks, there, were not, there was not an airport suitable for me to fly my Cessna into to do my business. The runway was there, but there's no fixed base operation, no way to buy fuel, no way to rent a car, no way to check weather and to file flight plans and what have you when we get there. So uh, to say that we have invested in our aviation infrastructure less than the state of South Carolina is a disgrace. And the legislature's had that ability. And we have put some money in our airports. But we need a consistent revenue source to fund this very valuable asset that we have. And we've got to maintain it. And it is only because we have these assets that we can attract these international and out-of-state companies. I'll give you one more story. Uh, I was at our, our local airport a few weeks ago. There was a business that's located nearby there. <clears throat> this big jet came in. It was a pretty large corporate jet. It might have been a Gulfstream. I'm not, I'm not rich enough to recognize all these oil burners. 
But this big jet taxied up to the FBO. About eight or ten folks got out of there, walked about as far as from here to that door, got in four, I think it was four different rental cars, and left. I, I asked the guys there, I said, who is that? They said, oh, that's a company that's located in town here. In five minutes, well, let's say ten minutes after that airplane landed, those executives, or whoever that was, that flew from Washington State, by the way, to our community, was on the job and working. Now, they could have gone to Hartsville. You know how long it takes to get your bags and get out of Hartsville? Maybe, maybe an hour after the plane leaves, you'd, you'd, you'd be over at the rental car facility. And then you could have driven an hour back to where they were. So the amendment just simply says that we will reinstate the collection of this fuel tax, a tax on the users, on December 31 instead of June 30. I would urge your support on that. I urge your support on the bill. And um, I hope that those who have talked so eloquently about their support of our infrastructure will honor that in the future years and allow us to maintain this valuable asset that we got. And Mr. President, I'll be glad to answer questions if there are any, but I am ready to take my seat, if not. Chair, sure, recognize Senator the 20th on a question. Uh, Senator, would you yield? Yes, sir. Uh, is it not true that I agree with you that our, all of our airports are uh, vital to the communities they serve and that I fully support uh, infrastructure funding for improvements to our rural airports in particular. If you say that, I want to believe you. Will you further yield? Yes, sir. Is it not true that the state sales tax on jet fuel is not dedicated to uh, infrastructure improvements on airport, but instead goes into the general fund? You're right, and that is in um, conflict with the federal regulations that say that on not all jet fuel to be perfectly clear but I believe on a date after 1987 taxes that were implemented were supposed to be spent on those airports and we have not been doing that even though there are many in the legislature over the years who have tried to get that in place uh, the FAA clearly recognizes that our aviation infrastructure of this country is important and because of states like Georgia, for whatever reason, that was not putting that money back into the infrastructure, just drawing from it, they have a, uh, a regulation or rule that states that that money should be uh, reinvested in, in airports. And, I, and, and let me say, to continue on that, perhaps we're overtaxing jet fuel. And, and if, if that be the case, I would fully support a reduction in that rate. And as a general aviation pilot that doesn't consume jet fuel but instead avgas, I think that that money should also be put in the pool to support our airports. Will the Senator further yield? I do. Uh, it's not true that I agree that's a discussion that we need to have, but that's not the bill before us today. Part of that discussion is not part of this bill and, and absolutely we should have been having this discussion for years and have had the discussion but the General Assembly for whatever reason has not chosen to, to do the right thing. Uh, thank you Senator. Chair recognize Senator 13 for a question. Thank you Mr. President. Will Senator yield for a series of three questions? Yes sir. First of all, Senator, isn't it true that we're dealing with this because of an executive order that's really overturning an issue that we dealt with in the General Assembly earlier this year and said no to? You're right. This issue has been up a number of times, and the General Assembly has refused to uh, act on this. And uh, the governor did take an executive order on June, July the 30th to take place on August the 1st. Isn't it also true that this amendment of yours will end that executive order sooner rather than later? Yes, sir. Isn't it also true, Senator, that I spoke with my insurance company just, this, just yesterday about the damages to my business from this storm? And in that conversation, I made uh, a comment about the devastation of South Georgia and, and that so many people are 
their homes were damaged and, and just devastated and uh, how I even hated to call and ask about my issues because I see others who are in greater need and that the most important issue in this special session is to deal with helping people devastated by this storm and not corporate issues? Yes, sir, and we have strongly supported that already this morning. But I will tell you that there were also airports devastated by this storm, and they are important to your community, and we need to, to support those airports and have the funds to, to maintain them. And, and this, this uh, amendment would help us do that quicker? Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Chair, recognize Senator from the 42nd for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? I do. You probably said this, Senator, um, and I probably missed it. Enlighten me as to what your column Jet A price is. Jet A is, 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 is jet fuel. Um, okay. It's referred, there are some different grades of jet fuel, but generally it's Jet A that's available. I just use that because it was shorter than saying jet fuel. Um, that is the price of the fuel that we're talking about at the various airports across the state. And the price varies quite a bit depending on the size of the airport, it looks like. It does. But n admittedly, the airlines don't pay the whatever it is, 7 or $8 that is listed for Hartsville. That's what a general aviation pilot would pay if they go into Hartsville. Thank you. Question, Senator. Well, I had a request this morning that whenever I spoke to you that um, I would smile. And so for the benefit of those that didn't recognize this as a smile, I will give you something that you all think is a smile. Have a great day. The, um, we, we're ready to uh, vote. Uh, the uh, only issue uh, on amendment number one, it is actually out of order because it, you are attempting to amend the substitute and the substitute is not in front of us. Any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to the Porter Committee? We fail to pass the bill. Chairs and other Porter Committees agreed to. All those in favor of the bill vote aye. Those opposed no. Secretary unlock the machine. Chair, recognize Senator 31st. Mr. President, the, the amendment before us clearly states that it is to amend LC 431050S, and it is a substitute that came out of the House. It's not, the, it, you're amend, you are amending not the substitute, you would be amending House Bill 5EX. Which is the bill that we have before us. The LC numbers match up. It is a substitute that came out of the House, and I think the amendment is in order. It's not the way I interpret it, Senator. You're voting on final passage of SB 5EX. On the passage of uh, House Bill 5EX, the yeas are 43, the nays are 19, and this bill, or C. Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore adopted.
Chair recognize Senator from the 30th. Mr. President, I move that the Senate stand adjourned. Sign a die. Recognize the representative for a motion. Our work is complete, so we at the Senate's completed their work, we've completed our work, so we're ready for a motion. From the lady from the 74th. We have a motion that we adjourn sine die. This house is adjourned sine die. Thank you, great work. Good work, y'all.